Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining this first uh, version of our virtual real estate breakfast. Uh, I'm Alejandro Guzman. Uh, I serve at the New Orleans Business Alliance as VP of Real Estate and Capital Investment. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this session today. Uh, we have been hosting real estate breakfast for the past year and a half uh, in partnership with our uh, Urban Land Institute of Louisiana, who have been a fabulous partner for economic development. And we're thrilled to have this first um, virtual version. The ULI uh, creates great content uh, from educational opportunities, networking, and community building. Uh, we love to partner with them for our economic development purposes. And today, uh, we have a great speaker, Bo Kemp, who's a senior director with Acreage Baker. He's an expert in public-private partnerships, economic development, and has a great reputation for driving innovation. We've been working with him at the New Orleans Business Alliance for the past year, and I can't say enough good things about Bo. You're up for a treat. He's fabulous. He has more than 15 to 20 years of experience working in the public sector and the private sector as well. And today, he's going to talk about uh, some tools, incentives, and trends he's observing at a national and even an international level to figure out how we're going to reactivate the real estate industry something that a lot of us are monitoring and working hard to come up with solutions given us. So you're gonna enjoy his presentation very much. Um, before we start, I just wanna give a quick uh, housekeeping item. We have enabled the Q&A section. So although we do have a section of this uh, program for exclusively Q&A, we do wanna encourage everybody that throughout the presentation, if you have any comments or questions, please send it to us. We'll be creating them throughout uh, Bo's presentation to make this a little bit more interactive. And of course, at the end, uh, we'll apply this time of Q&A exclusively for questions and uh, have a conversation. So without further ado, I wanna hand it over to Bo, uh, who's prepared great material, and I trust that you're gonna enjoy his presentation. So with that, Bo, welcome. Thank you for taking the time to talk to us. And I'm looking forward to all of the things you have to say. Well, thank you very much, Alejandra and the Urban Land Institute team. Um, it's been great working with you guys and the fabulous uh, city of New Orleans in the Southeast Louisiana area for the last year. Um, <clears throat> I have put together a presentation that borrows on some of the elements that um, I, I have talked about in other presentations, uh, but with a slightly different twist, uh, given the state of things with regards to COVID-19. And so <clears throat> the first portion of the presentation is going to talk a little bit about expectations of what's happening globally, as well as on a local level, uh, not only for real estate, but for businesses, because obviously all of these things are interrelated. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about um, how I think it plays itself out in terms of the opportunities for real estate investment going forward and end with a few examples of how <clears throat> other communities or uh, projects that are happening around the country uh, might serve as a template for how you might pursue real estate opportunities given the current environment. And just to check in real quick, I've shared my screen. Hopefully everyone can see the title page. Maybe Nicole, if you can, you can shake your head. So I can still see you. <clears throat> All right, excellent. So uh, first is the commercial. For those of you who may not know me um, and not to go too deep into the commercial, given Alejandra has already sung my praises, thank you. Um, we've been doing work around this space for a long time on both sides of the table, so to speak, right? So both as a public administrator uh, working in multiple cities, um, I've had the opportunity to evaluate and work with and pursue uh, major uh, real estate development projects from a municipal standpoint. And on the other side, as a private entity, uh, working with a variety of folks to do the exact same thing and incorporate all of the different types of incentives and resources that exist, not only at the municipal level, the county and the state level, at the federal level, and also be able to think about those things from the perspective of a private entity who's actually making direct investments and what some of their concerns around risk mitigation and access to capital may very well be. Um, 
our firm and the work that I've been doing over the course of the last two years um, has kind of brought us to a place where we've become a leader in the opportunity zone space. Opportunity zones in and of themselves are not the panacea, but as you will see in this presentation, as uh, the federal government in particular is starting to figure out how to reallocate its resources to address a lot of the COVID issues, there's going to be an alignment between where they're making additional investments and opportunity zones. And so it's going to be something to pay attention to. With that said, let me kind of launch into the market trends um, that we see with regards to COVID-19 and, and real estate. And I'm going to start at a very, very high level. So <clears throat> we're still going through a process of the stages of response to the pandemic itself. Um, we are just emerging and these are kind of overlapping. So they're gonna happen uh, as some are still going on, new ones are gonna begin. We just really started to emerge from the healthcare response phase. Um, and in that phase, obviously there's been the lockdown and pretty much all investments have been halted. We've also started and are starting to emerge, still going through the employment triage uh, stage. And that's where we've gotten some of the local response and the federal response particularly the CARES Act. You know, at the healthcare uh, crisis stage, we started with the Stafford Act, which is an emergency response act, which I know many in the area locally here will be familiar with. Um, now we've gotten to the CARES Act with the expectation that there are gonna be some additional bills that are passed at the federal level that are designed to address issues specific to employment. But this employment work has actually started to kind of migrate, right? So we started with what was a healthcare uh, crisis it was immediately followed by a liquidity crisis that the feds have tried to resolve. And it's starting to morph into a solvency crisis. And we'll come back to this issue later. We're at that point right now between kind of the employment triage and the local stimulus plan. The idea behind the local stimulus plan is that now that there is some level of containment with regards to the pandemic and people can see what the impact has been with regards to employment as a result of both the lockdown and the pandemic itself, individual municipalities, <clears throat> uh, both the parishes, uh, the cities, states and federal government are all now trying to figure out exactly how do I put a plan into place that ends up becoming a local stimulus plan. Now, many municipalities are at a very different phase in this than we've at, at, at the federal government level. Some municipalities, and this is not germane specifically to New Orleans, are still in denial about what the impact is likely to be on their individual uh, tax receipts with regards to this plan. But it's starting to come into vision, especially as many municipalities, whether they have a July 1st tax year um, or a January 1st tax year, are either in the middle of a budgeting process for the summer or about to start a, a budgeting process as they move into the fall are really starting to come to terms with what is the expected financial impact and what are the levers that the municipality itself has to try to drive the kind of growth that's gonna be necessary for success on a going forward basis. Now that will slowly start to translate into real recovery plans. What we've really done to date by and large throughout the country has not been stimulus oriented. It's basically been to stop the bleeding um, and what has to happen is there has to be some thoughts around how to grow the economy, um, not just to, to recover or keep the economy in balance from where we are today. Um, that will begin to happen. And as that starts to also happen at the same time, there's going to begin to be a true understanding for each of the municipalities of exactly what the impact is likely to be uh, on their numbers. It's hard for them to have that impact right now. Uh, because they are in the midst of still figuring out what is the tax receipts, what are the returns they're likely to get in states, often like Louisiana, where a lot of the receipts are based on sales tax. The speed of the impact and the magnitude of the impact is going to depend to a large extent on what happens this summer. In places where there are property taxes, um, they won't actually get a full sense of what the impact is going to be for a little while down the road. Um, even when you look at each of those different kind of uh, different components, those people, for example, that are relying on property taxes, if you are in a community that is an older community where more people own their homes, um, you'll have a different response in terms of the tax impact 
than those people who have more homes that are in mortgage and therefore the mortgage banker is actually collecting the funds. So there's some, there are gonna be some major differences of what happens in each of these communities. And some of it is not gonna be completely clear up front. For example, communities that are legacy cities, and I'll use as an example, both Newark and Gary, Indiana, where I've done a lot of work, um, just as an example, they have an older population. They may not have as high a property tax base, but a larger portion of their tax base actually owns their home. And so the way those cities actually get their money comes directly from the residents themselves, as opposed to, you know, suburbs where um, the, high, the owner, home ownership may be higher as a percentage, but most of the homes are actually in mortgage. And therefore, every time people are paying a portion of their mortgage, a portion of the money for taxes is actually being set aside in escrow. Um, and that will change the dynamics of how people receive their money. Anyway, the broader point here is just to say, we're still kind of in the first third of the process of going through the response stage. Um, and so part of what I'm trying to do in this presentation is give you a sense of how to position yourself for what we think is to come. So, you know, everyone's talking about a new normal, and this is kind of our high level expectation of what a new normal looks like in real estate. There are some global trends and some local trends, all of which we think are important. So at the global level, globalization and broadly is in retreat, meaning that in every country, uh, major country around the world, there is a thought to reshape the extent to which they've been reliant on outside um, countries to supply major important goods. The interconnectedness of the world isn't gonna be eradicated, but there are gonna be some really important shifts around investment and production patterns. And we think that has an implication for real estate on a going forward basis. Um, we also think there are gonna be major travel patterns shifting. Uh, much of what happened after 9-11 was that um, people didn't stop traveling, but their travels shifted, right? So there was less international travel and more domestic travel. We think the same is likely to happen now. It, it may happen for very different reasons. Before people were afraid to take planes because they were unsure of what the risk was to be on a plane. Today, many of the countries we might want to travel to may not accept us as Americans, um, given the rate of um, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic here, versus other countries. So there are a couple of different dynamics here at play. We think that there is likely to be um, an uptick in domestic travel. And so places where people can drive to in order to um, vacation, we think are gonna see a benefit at least in the, the, the next five to years or give or take um, as you know, eventually international travel will uh, resume. We think that there is gonna be a retrenchment on business travel. And this we think is not likely to be short term, but to be more structural. I think many companies have figured out how much money they can save by not allowing a lot of their employees to travel business wise and have gotten people to a point where they become much more comfortable with virtual activities, much like we're doing today. Uh, and so that means there are gonna be some shifts around business travel, but we think those locations that have acyclical demand, things like military bases, hospitals, universities, where people will need to travel to those, not just because it's a nice to have as part of a business component, but it's a necessary component to either their work or other forms of commerce are gonna outperform. And in this case, New Orleans, we think fits that pattern very, very well. There's also a new normal around personal interaction and we're all kind of trying to figure this out, but we think it will have an important uh, impact on every category of uh, uh, assets, not just hospitality, which is the obvious one, but retail. We can all see right now, if you want to go into certain stores, you're often standing in line, waiting six feet apart in order to be let in, uh, in order to be able to shop so they can keep the capacity of the number of people in a building down. We think it's going to have an impact on class A office space, demand, and even industrial uh, areas. There are going to be several components that have to be rethought and reimagined food and worker safety, customer and client safety, crowd management safety, and then the expectations um, of interactions. You know, when people go to meet people in crowded spaces, what does that interaction look like? There's a lot of work that needs to be done here. Most of the companies that you would expect that are trying to reshape and kind of curate what that experience would look like today are retail companies. But most of those retail companies right now 
are in the midst of trying to figure out how to move as much as what they have into an online platform. And they're not investing a lot of time in thinking about what these personal interaction dynamics should look like, but that is to come going forward. <clears throat> Lastly, and I think most importantly to this conversation, uh, public money is gonna for at least the next couple of years drive um, private real estate investment as opposed to it being the other way around. Um, there's been this trend towards public private partnerships anyway, um, but in many instances, the public money has wanted to wait until a private entity has identified a project or a location that they're interested in to try to pursue, and then for them to bring uh, their public money uh, in order to kind of buttress that, that project. Uh, I think this is gonna change and it's gonna move in reverse. A lot of it is because the level of uncertainty that exists right now in the market, I think is holding back a lot of private companies from making decisions to either continue their investments or move forward with new projects. But perhaps more importantly, there are going to be additional bills that come from the federal government to try to stimulate the economy. That money is flowing from the federal to the state to the local level. And a lot of it is going to be focused on infrastructure and other things that can be used by local municipalities to send a signal, but also to make an investment in specific projects or specific areas that will help to mitigate the risk of a private investor following on board. Um, and so a lot of that money is designed um, where, wherever it comes from to actually follow uh, those areas that are most in need um, as designated by low income communities. Um, and those are correlated closely uh, to opportunity zones. We, we think that there are a couple of issues um, that we're starting to see and where we think things are gonna move specific to real estate as a result of what we just described. So <clears throat> we think there's gonna be a, a retreat to subsidize investments for real estate broadly. Um, a lot of the work that's been done over the last few years has been around class A residential, some mixed use market rate apartments and townhomes. We think that's gonna start to migrate um, down from class A to class B, class C, uh, residential workforce and mixed income uh, housing, things like mobile home parks. And we're not suggesting that these are the only things that'll get funded. But what we're trying to share with you is the idea that these are areas where either the um, market rate is affordable and therefore there's a lot more comfort in taking the risk that the revenue that you are associating with this project will be stable and consistent given all of the constraints that the consumer might have and or there are things like vouchers and other federal subsidies or uh, LIHTC, low income housing tax credits and other things that will actually subsidize the capacity to build any of these new projects in a way that the class A portion is not subsidized, right? So we see a movement going from the class A residential to class C residential. Likewise, on the hospitality side, um, <clears throat> a lot of the new construction has been around full service and boutique and select hotels. We think that that's gonna move to a place where um, a lot of investors are gonna be looking at busted construction, construction that had started prior to COVID that didn't get complete, their liquidity dried up, and as a result, their project is languishing there are gonna be select opportunities there. We also think that there is gonna be some uh, selective uh, acquisition um, of assets um, and they're gonna to tend towards kind of a boutique, a boutique and select hotels, but also a couple of full service. We think that broadly the hospitality industry in order to stay competitive, the, the highest uh, priced brands are gonna to start to reprice themselves uh, kind of down a notch, so to speak, to make sure that they can stay competitive in the market. And that's gonna have an impact on those businesses that can actually stay afloat um, and uh, those businesses that might end up uh, looking like an interesting acquisition uh, project as a result. So uh, I wanna jump in for a second. Uh, we've encouraged uh, participants to state their questions. There have been a couple that came in that I think are relevant and that could uh, nourish this conversation. Uh, so, uh, some people are asking, how is the federal money flowing and what does that mean for this type of, of projects? I think it's relevant. Uh, both of us have had an experience talking at a federal level that, that answers that. So, if you could speak to that, that will be uh, useful for attendees hearing this presentation. Sure. So, I actually have a slide coming up that I kind of speak to it. Um, so if, if you don't mind, I'm going to wait until I get to that slide to talk about that in more detail. Um, 
it, you said you had another question or should I continue on to, to that slide? I think that, that if, if you address that slide, it will answer that. People just, okay. just you know, they, they're concerned about state or cities being broke and how does that affect the flow of money and how yes. does that play into to class assets that you're just describing. And I yeah. think that is a very relevant point. And Absolutely. Uh, thank you for addressing that. So I'm, I'm gonna get to that, I think, in one or two slides. Um, and and we'll, we can spend some time talking about it because I think it's important. There's some things that are conjecture, but there's some things that we have a sense of what's likely to happen based on previous experience, both the recession of 2001 and the recession of 2008, how money was spent and what kinds of projects were activated versus ones that were not, uh, give us some clues. Um, <clears throat> just the last point on this slide, most of the other efforts prior to COVID um, had really been limited, particularly around opportunity zones, but in broad space around investments in businesses. We think that that's gonna change a lot um, on a going forward basis. And that many of the real estate investments that people are gonna be pursuing going forward will also have an operating component to it, whether they're in an opportunity zone or not. And this is another way of kind of mitigating risk, right? It's uh, investing in the anchor tenant that's also going to be part of the lease or uh, leasee um, of your uh, uh, new project, right? It's whether that be anything from a medical center where you've got doctors and hospitals that um, are actually both having an investment that goes into them as well as they end up becoming a tenant um, or it be anything else. Um, lastly, we think there's going to be a substantial increase around publicly supported infrastructure. Um, and this is actually a good segue to the question in part that you just asked about, you know, where's the money likely to come in and, and how it's likely to impact. The, the, the next couple of slides will start to speak to that issue a little bit, and they will dovetail with, you know, not just the question of how broke cities are, uh, because the answer is very <laughs> across the board. Um, and even those places that actually have rainy day funds um, that have benefited more recently from the uptick in the economy the last decade or so are going to really struggle, I think, in the in the incoming environment, but also specifically businesses. So what this chart here really speaks to is kind of the emergency that we're in right now. And this was written specific to businesses, but frankly, it is a direct correlation almost to municipalities to think about. You know, kind of the very first thing that you do once you recognize that you are in the um, kind of uh, crisis that we are in is to figure out, you know, do I have the capacity to stay afloat and manage through the crisis itself? Um, and so for the last 30 to 45 days, companies have been making a binary decision. Do I close now? Um, because I already had liabilities prior to COVID. You know, by closing down the economy, I've actually eradicated my ability to generate cash flow to deal with my past liabilities and I'm still accruing new liabilities, even while I'm on shutdown, even if I've laid off all of my staff and everything else, because I've got no cash flow coming in. There have been a few things that the government has done to try to address this issue. And that's what you see underneath kind of the first arrow, you know, express loans, the economic injury disaster loans, local grants, all of which has been designed to stave off as many companies as possible for making the first decision of, do I just close now? Uh, and cut my losses um, before I go any deeper into the COVID process. But we're now moving into a different phase, which is the gray area, which says, well, can I make it through the crisis? So we're still in the midst of the crisis. A lot of the companies are still not open. Um, even if they have decided to pursue things like the Paycheck Protection Plan, which is an SBA sponsored event um, uh, project, uh, the economic injury, um, many of these things require bank support. They may require collateral. Um, many of these businesses are already, you know, fairly leveraged and have concerns about that. More importantly, even if they take that money, um, rehiring or keeping on their staff throughout the period that they're closed might not change the, the, the uh, calculus that they have to make of whether to stay afloat uh, once the crisis is over, especially since the timing of the crisis being over is not determined at this stage. But we're at the point now where companies are deciding, should I take that kind of money? Um, and will that money kind of get me through this period where I'm still accumulating liabilities as a result of the shutdown and I'm still not generating cash flow 
or in some cases for those businesses that are able to operate with curbside or takeout or other types of things where they can actually work remotely, they may be operating, but at a much, much lower capacity um, than they had previously. They're making that decision of, can I make it through the crisis? But both of those things, which is kind of where we are, uh, depending on the company that you're talking about, or for that matter, the municipality, don't address the next issue, which is, can I restart my business? What is it that it takes for me to actually be in a position now that people are back to work, now that we've gone through the crisis, the crisis, how do I spend, where do I get the capital from to make the investments that are required in order for me to really restart my business? And so there are some real serious issues. The same kind of pattern applies to municipalities. It applies to the businesses that I've outlined here. What you can see in the boxes is the initial response of the federal government Many individual municipalities or parishes are trying to replicate components of this to add on uh, to address these issues. Um, everyone's doing their best. All of it has been insufficient um, to really get to the heart of the matter. And so we're expecting pretty significant um, numbers of companies to shut down and become insolvent. Um, you probably had heard, if you haven't, there was an additional 2 million uh, people who filed for unemployment this past week. That makes a total of 40 million people in the course of the last 10 weeks. Um, and we're still at the stage where a lot of the public companies have actually not already announced the layoffs that they're likely to have. It's starting to happen. Obviously, we had Hertz that closed, uh, filed for bankruptcy recently. Um, but we think this, unfortunately, is going to continue to uh, happen throughout the course uh, of the summer. What the public entities have been doing, the federal government, the states, has been trying to put money into the buckets that you see here on your left. And this gets directly to the question that was asked before. So Housing and Urban Development, Small Business Administration, uh, the Economic Development uh, Administration have been the entities that have received the majority of the money. And just to give you a sense of order of magnitude, the um, EDA would typically get something in the range of, I believe, maybe, you know, this is an order of magnitude. If they got $3 million every year, this year as a result of the crisis, they got 300 million, right? So the amount of money that's been invested in some of these entities is in some cases literally 100 times what they typically are getting um, in order to address this issue. So this poses both um, some problems that have to be mitigated, but an opportunity as well. And what we're seeing and what I'm suggesting in the broader presentation is that those that are in the real estate space can actually be really smart and strategic at figuring out how to partner with municipalities to access some of these funds to both uh, reduce the cost of some of the projects, mitigate some of that risk, but also jumpstart some of those projects without you having to put a lot of your own private capital out first because the public has the, uh, has the money that's available to kind of jumpstart a lot of these projects. And so whether it's real estate related projects that are residential, um, that are mixed use, that have a portion of market rate and subsidize that can leverage home funds or 504 uh, uh, loans, um, vouchers. Um, that's an opportunity to have a direct conversation with cities around these types of issues. Uh, whether it be some of the operating companies that may end up being tenants in that real estate um, that need to think through more strategically, um, how and when do I reopen? How do I keep my uh, employees paid? and they're leveraging the Paycheck Protection Plan or the Economic uh, Injury uh, Disaster Loans, IDLE, or for that matter, just regular 7A uh, loans from the SBA. I think there's a really strategic opportunity around the Economic Development Administration uh, to focus not, on, not only on construction grants, which they offer all the time, um, but also revolving loan grants that can support small businesses, capacity building and planning grants, which by its nature is more focused on the public but the nature of the scope of work that those people could be financed can have an impact on driving private investment. I will tell you um, specifically, as a result of the CARES Act, one of the things that's happened is the uh, limitations of the amount of money that's available, let's say for a construction grant. A construction grant for EDA is typically um, designed to provide, so for example, one of the projects that I worked on, we built a $14 million road that took you from the highway into a casino and it needed to be reconstructed to segregate casino traffic from truck traffic because it was an industrial area. Um, those types of projects, um, typically only 3 million of that 14 could come from 
the EDA. Um, and of that 3 million, the city was required to typically have anywhere from a low of a 20% um, uh, to a high of a 40% match. Well, because of the CARES Act now, um, you can actually get rid of the match in some cases altogether. Um, and there's no limitation of the $3 million. So that project potentially could have been totally funded um, by the EDA. And that road was a necessary uh, component to actually $300 million of additional investment that would happen with regards to the, to the casino. And that's the sort of thinking I'm trying to encourage in terms of the real estate side now of how you can become more aggressive and more creative of leveraging these public funds in order to uh, uh, encourage uh, growth on the real estate side. The last bucket that you see down here is local uh, municipal funds, recovery funds. Um, this is something that um, we are pursuing. Uh, I've been personally pursuing, and some cities are doing this to a greater or lesser degree. Um, but just to use an example outside of New Orleans, Indianapolis, the chamber created a, a recovery loan fund um, where what they are doing are very small loans an average loan size there of like $17,000, but they've been able to actually put to work $6 million um, in uh, the metropolitan area of Indianapolis over the course of the last 10 weeks. Um, they've been able to actually support small businesses, small retail companies, um, but the idea behind the fund is that they are leveraging uh, private money that's being managed at a public level to really address some of the issues in the previous slide about whether or not companies can stay afloat or not, because they recognize even at the home base level, these are individual tax paying entities that they want to stay viable throughout the course of the coronavirus pandemic. And they need to provide that support because ultimately it turns into tax revenue for the municipality. There are gonna be more recovery funds like this created. Some of them are gonna be very strategic and targeted to certain industries that are critical to the nature of the local uh, areas themselves. Some of them will be grant focused, some will be debt or equity, and some will be as uh, we like to call dequity. They will be really debt driven, but so low interest with such a long term that it'll feel almost like equity, even though technically they will be debt uh, products. Um, and then you're gonna start to see more around asset recycling, which is another way for municipalities to extract value from the investments that have already been made into public assets, uh, whether it be roads, whether it be bridges and other forms of infrastructure, uh, wastewater, other components, utilities, where there is value that is tied into the public investment that's been made over decades that actually can be taken out through a public-private partnership to be reinvested in either new projects, whether they be economic development projects that include some of the real estate investment that you might participate in, infrastructure, which is designed to support those projects, or in some cases, uh, directly into the municipal budget itself. Just to take a quick pause, um, I'm hoping that I address the issue, at least at some level, that was asked in terms of where that money at a federal level is likely to come. What I will say, in addition, is um, we do expect that there are going to be additional bills that come out of the federal government. Uh, if you had asked that question two or three weeks ago, you probably would have heard people on the Hill say that there's likely to be, you know, a CARES Act two, three, four, five, um, that's going to take place. Um, as you could probably see, if you've been uh, paying attention to the conversations on the Hill today, uh, the House has already passed uh, what they call the HEROES Act, which is really kind of CARES 3.0, uh, I'll call, I'll characterize it. Um, and there's discussions about another act because um, the HEROES Act focuses on local stimulus. So if you refer back to the second slide where I talked about uh, localities are starting to now rethink, how do I get the financing that I need in order to be a viable municipal entity, but also to make some strategic investments? The HEROES uh, uh, legislation that's been passed by the House, not been passed by the Senate to date, um, tries to address that. I think there's a high likelihood that a bill actually, whether it's called the HEROES Act, but in that vein, actually does get passed between now and sometime in the summer. Um, I also think there's a high likelihood that there will be another bill that takes place between now and September. Um, I think the likelihood that there's going to be more bills um, 
after September is very, very low. So any additional funding that's likely to come at the federal level will happen between now and September. September 30th is technically the fiscal year end for the federal government. They have to produce their budget at that time. Plus, obviously, we're going to be in the heavy part of election season for a lot of localities and on a national level. Um, it is not expected that bills are going to be passed between you know, September 30th and sometime in November. Um, there's a possibility that there could be some bills that happen in the lame duck session that happens between November and January of uh, the next year. Um, but we think most the bills that are likely to have the biggest impact, and there's likely to be two of them, will happen between now um, and the end of September. One being focused on local stimulus, filling the gaps uh, at the local level of the financial wherewithal that cities have, the second being around infrastructure. The issue, I think, with regards to the local um, uh, stimulus aspect is that whatever happens at the federal level will be insufficient to stave off the changes that are going to have to be made at the, at the city level, right? So cities are going to be laying off people. Um, service is going to be cut and uh, taxes are likely to go up. And that's almost across the board in every community. And those places that have a strong kind of rainy day fund, they may be able to stave off those changes for a year to 18 months. Um, but those changes are going to come down the pike pretty much across the board around the country, um, even with a very robust bill that comes from the federal government. So um, with that said, <clears throat> I want to refer to the chart that you see in front of you around how this is specific to opportunity zones, but I think it's relevant to, to real estate broadly, which is for the last two years, there's been a focus on those projects that are essentially were already investment ready. Um, and they were swapping out in the case of opportunity zones, one capital stack for another capital stack. We've now transitioned to a different place where we're now looking at projects that were concepts back in 2018 that now have gone beyond concepts and are actually now in the process of implementation. Um, I'm going to show you three uh, projects, uh, two in particular, that fall into the category of this concept ready um, aspect that um, I'm talking about. Where I think this is important for you as a real estate investor is the degree to which you've got projects you're interested in that fall in line with areas that um, are going to get targeted uh, for additional federal monies, partially because they're in an opportunity zone and partially because it's one of the projects that cities are very interested in. These are the places where you can actually start to extract value out of municipalities, encouraging them to make the public investments that are necessary to reduce your risk and increase the likelihood of your return. Um, and in line by you actually making a private commitment to co-invest in, 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 uh, in a way uh, with the public entity, it makes it easier for them to go back to the feds or to the state and actually draw down more capital to support these projects. This is where we are. This is where we were going to be regardless with regards uh, to opportunity zones pre-COVID. But I think this is where we are for almost all real estate in this post-COVID world for the next couple of years. But I think we've also accelerated the time frame that we move into what I designed here, or I called here the late stage opportunity zone investments that combine operating companies and real estate projects. Um, that I think is going to be a key component of how real estate projects actually get done on a going forward basis. And I think these things are smushed together a little bit in 2020 as opposed to even waiting to 2021. Um, just for time, because I think there are some questions, I'm going to move through some of these areas. But what this chart basically speaks to is the process that I was describing of leveraging uh, municipal entities for pre-development needs um, and getting those municipalities to work on a lot of the site aggregation, zoning, other components that can reduce your risk on a private level. Um, and then using that as a way to have highly targeted catalyst projects and anchor projects that jumpstart the development in broad scale uh, concepts. I'm going to take a second, talk through this page at a high level. And what this page is supposed to, to try to give you a sense of is, okay, <clears throat> um, if I'm looking at a hospital area or a retail and entertainment area, a commercial or tech area, or residential housing, what are the things that actually provide me the sustainable competitive advantage uh, in that, eight, that, that space? And what is it that I can do either as a individual private real estate investor or in concert 
uh, with the municipality to jumpstart that activity? And where is the funding for that likely to come uh, as a pre-development source? So in the case of hospitals, you know, the uh, aggregation of medical professionals actually enhances your ability for recruitment. Um, and one of the things that we think actually has a, a, a dramatic impact in that space is OZ back companies that are either in the bio space or the medical space in one form or another. And so one of the ways to jumpstart that is around VC partnerships. And this is just to give you kind of a thought process of how I might be able to tailor some of the efforts that I'm interested in as a real estate investor, investor um, to actually encourage the kind of um, tenants um, and, and residents that I want. Um, likewise, obviously ease of access and, and high traffic is critical for real estate, um, for uh, retail and entertainment. Um, upgrades to transportation that facilitate more traffic or easier traffic are key. And a lot of that is driven by state and federal funding support. I'm gonna show you one project where we believe that the investment in the infrastructure of transportation actually can help to jumpstart um, additional private investment. Around commercial uh, and tech companies, um, their issue is often proximity to the desirable workforce. Housing density matters in that case because a lot of those people wanna be able to walk to work. Um, again, this is a place where state, federal, and including private uh, funding can be important. And then lastly, around residential housing. Um, where often it's not only proximity to work, but it's also public amenities that drive the interest of where people want to live. Transportation upgrades also play a role. And again, state and federal private funding can matter. And I'm going to show you a couple of projects where I think these elements come into play. So around projects. So one of the projects uh, that I've actually been working on for the last year too is probably the largest opportunity zone project in the US. It's in Tampa, Florida, uh, Hillsborough County. It's actually in the unincorporated part of the city of Tampa, but in the county of Hillsborough. Um, the total area is actually 19 square miles. <laughs> it sits between two highways, I-275 and I-75, um, but the core area is actually a mall called the University Mall, which is a 100-acre mall. What makes this interesting and just to kind of you know, hopefully stir some, some ideas for you as investors is, it leverages a lot of the assets that are already there, but stays very focused on its core. So within walking distance of the mall is Bush Gardens, 4 million visitors a year. The University of South Florida, 44,000 students is literally across the street uh, from the mall. And then there are three hospitals. There's the Veterans Hospital, there's a cancer hospital, hospital the Moffitt Cancer Hospital, and then Advent Tampa Hospital that are also within a mile of the mall itself. And the idea here is that we're leveraging all of these assets to redevelop the space in a way that will provide both equitable um, growth, um, but also really jumpstart private investment. As a result of the work that we've done over the course of the last year, we've been able to bring in, as you can see here, the University of South Florida Institute for Applied Engineering, which is actually taking over a portion uh, of the mall and actually helping to create this into an innovation district uh, that we are using to leverage and we're working directly with venture capital companies to get existing businesses in the Tampa area to relocate to this area as an opportunity zone. The mall itself is a, a adaptive reuse of the mall. So the mall is a million plus square feet. It, it received a new um, zoning designation that allows it to scale to 7 million in the same footprint. They're actually taking the mall and putting a road right through the middle of the mall, creating both uh, residential and retail uh, combination of the mall itself, and then taking some of the older buildings that were connected to the mall, the old JC Penney's, um, and readapting that to class A office space, some of the parking lot, turning that into actually uh, mixed income uh, housing, um, and redeveloping the entire area around it, coupled with major investments in two areas, infrastructure, to be able to allow students to get back and forth, not only to each of the highway areas and to living spaces, but all the way to downtown. And then uh, also a focus on wastewater. And one of the things you'll see is <clears throat> this also sits in an area that has a very vulnerable population, where if you just made the investments with regards to uh, the growth, you could easily push out people who don't have the financial means uh, to stay as this area improves. 
one of the charges from the city of Tampa, the county of Hillsborough, and the innovation team that we've been working on is to make sure that we don't push any of those people out. And that means that we have to scale up. To do that means we have to actually create infrastructure that doesn't exist. And this little chart that you'll see on your right-hand side basically shows how housing, population density, and infrastructure improvements all work together in order to allow for us to achieve the kind of growth that we want without the displacement. Now, we're also thinking about the displacement of businesses in addition to people. So as you redevelop the mall, a lot of what's in the mall, because it's been a struggling, failing mall, been hair companies and barbershops and other things, they actually serve a purpose for that community. And we need to make sure that even though they may not be the correct tenant to be in the mall on a going forward basis, given how the mall is being redeveloped, we need to create a commercial corridor where those businesses can exist and thrive. And so we've actually designated a, a street that actually runs directly into the mall and goes through some of the hardest hit uh, residential areas around the mall as the commercial corridor that we wanna transition those businesses that no longer fit within the mall and the concept of the mall to move into those places so that they don't go out of business and they stay in proximity to the population there. Um, and what you see on the left-hand side here are the kinds of gating issues that we have to address the transportation and the infrastructure, this is where you can go and often get money directly from the federal government and the state to help um, start to instigate the real estate development that we're talking about. On the site specific issues, many of those are driven at the local municipal level where you can work with the municipality around the site control, land use, zoning, and other pre-development. But last but not least, there are issues that relate to the operators because again, in many instances, the investment is being made in an operator and real estate together. And so we're doing a lot of work with uh, companies that essentially um, are uh, the Sherpas, I'll call them, of uh, venture capital, where we're trying to work with those businesses to actually recruit venture capital companies to come here and to work with them on making combined investments where they become tenants and their investors uh, together. This is another project um, and this one will be more familiar to a lot of folks that are on the call. Um, this is Lake Forest Boulevard in New Orleans, the area where the old mall was, where most of that has been uh, demolished. It has many of the same uh, benefits that we talked about earlier, meaning that there has been a substantial public improvement of the uh, parks that are directly across the street from the mall. Um, there's a huge medical district that sits in proximity and there's an opportunity to make a substantial improvement of transportation assets in the area that actually will not only benefit the existing businesses that are operating there like the medical air space, but also make it easier for us to create residential in this space that could be directly tied to downtown and a lot of places where people work. Um, this is the, the kind of project that I'm referring to um, where you've taken this concept and you've started to activate it where you can take like the old Lowe's that happens to be sitting there and repurpose it much in the same way that the mall that I described in Tampa is being repurposed uh, and then build around it mixed use residential. Um, and in order really to activate the space, you're gonna need to build density of people because that people is what will actually drive the next level of investment around retail. And that means it's probably gonna need to be mixed income and you're gonna need to rely on some support from subsidized housing, but right now in this environment, that subsidized housing is a lot stronger and easier for you as a real estate investor to borrow against than market rate, given that there's a lot of uh, uncertainty as to what the impacts are gonna be on the market. So this is another example of how these things uh, can tie together. You know, <clears throat> the third is kind of conceptual um, and it's something that I'm, I'm working on that is not set yet, but I wanna use it as just an example of how to think through certain types of industries that have had a particular impact. Um, as I mentioned before, the health crisis has turned into a liquidity crisis, which is morphing into uh, a solvency crisis. And all of this is having a tremendous impact on hospitality and will continue to over the next couple of years. 50% of all the losses in the country have been actually in the hospitality industry, so of the 40 million people who've lost their job, almost 20 million of them have come in the hospitality industry one form or another. The government support has been critical, but not sufficient to stem the tide of those bankruptcies. Um, and 
what we're finding, and this goes to the point of combining the operating investment with the real estate investment, is that many of these entrepreneurs who own these hospitality uh, assets, they're strong managers, so you don't need to replace them, but they desperately need to find a way to inject capital into their business in order to stay afloat. And they're willing to consider selling stakes of equity at a discount to the market in order to have a chance to essentially restructure and buy their, sell, their, buy their equity back in the future. We think that this is going to be true for a lot of industries. You're also seeing the similar sort of impact that you're seeing in hospitality and oil and gas, you're beginning to see um, in your market, but there are other industries that will have a similar sort of impact. We think that there are funds, recovery funds that can be developed that can speak directly to this as an issue that combine both the operating and the real estate investment. Um, you know, the fund that we're working on right now, which is not set yet, we're hoping to do this in multiple um, cities around the country, um, <clears throat> talks about us operating in undervalued hospitality areas, uh, combining places where we think that there's some improvements and co-locating in opportunity zones, but also looking at a portfolio um, that is driven by some of the acyclical demand that I talked about earlier, medical, university, and activity and, and the like. So this was all hopefully just to spur uh, some thinking on your side. I know we're getting towards the end and I'll open it up for, uh, for questions. Thank you, Bill. This was fantastic as uh, the usual. I enjoy your presentation a lot. Uh, we are grateful to have a very active audience and we have a couple of questions. Uh, some of them, I'm just going to combine them for the interest of time. And uh, the first one is related to this last slide. And uh, I think that you mentioned two things during your presentation. One is the, the interest of funders for projects that combine operating businesses and real estate assets. And that is key for New Orleans, I think, and for the region because of our hospitality industry and the current context. So if you can drill a little bit on what that means for New Orleans and what is the importance of combining those two things? Um, sure. If you could, please. So, so I'll try to be shorter in my answers just because I know there's a number. Um, the two drivers from an economic standpoint when you are investing in operating businesses um, is, um, regardless of whether you're in an opportunity zone or not, um, you can take advantage of the small uh, stock, 1202 stock, which basically says that any gain that you get up to a certain dollar amount, $10 million within a five year period, you can actually not have to pay any capital gains on. You can combine that though with opportunity zones if your investment happens to be in an opportunity zone and be able to extend that over a 10 year period for greater than $10 million. All of that has a, you know, a demonstrable impact on potentially the cash on cash return um, and the IRR that any investor can find. And in instances where you're able to make that operating investment and have some of the stability of also having a real estate asset, which is not likely to um, you know, lose its value um, quickly over time, you kind of get the best of both worlds. You've secured um, an investment in an asset that is likely to stay stable over a period of time, even in a troubled market. And you've given yourself a chance to get, you know, unfettered upside in an operating business where you might actually get a portion of that, a large portion of that without having to pay capital gains tax. And that just has a big impact on what the return profile of these kinds of investments look like which in some way is good news within this context that, you know, there are deals that could be made. I know it's not that easy to, right. to solidify, but in a way it's good news that there are options that could be attractive for investors so we can recover from this situation. So that's great news. Um, uh, another question, and again, I'm combining questions just in the interest of time is um, going back to, uh, I call it the holistic approach. Some of the examples that you showed uh, include different type of classic investments uh, tied up to public investment to make a community thrive. And uh, I, I think the point to drive here is that to reactivate certain communities and to make an equity investment, we have to think with different projects. It's not just one project that's going to save a community or that will make a great investment. It has to be multiple projects. That's right. So tied to that idea, uh, some participants are asking, what would you recommend public officials to invest in 
uh, to make this type of projects uh, happen. And yep. one last thing, just to to tie up the the this this multiple questions, I guess, uh, is a, a lot of participants today are in different task force, given recommendations to both the governor and our mayor. So your input will be valuable uh, in real time. Great, great. Well, so I think um, if there was one, there, there, the answer is probably multiple places, but two places that matter tremendously. One is around um, the investment in either um, low-income housing tax credits, 9% tax credits particularly versus the 4%, um, and or um, uh, vouchers. Um, and <clears throat> this is important because many communities really struggle with the idea that um, they feel they either have enough uh, affordable housing already, um, or they're worried about the nature of people that would come into an area that has affordable housing. But you can't pencil out deals for the most part anymore, um, particularly in this environment, where there isn't the kind of stability that you get from knowing that you've essentially got a government that's going to pay for 20% or 30%, whatever the, the portion of the project is affordable um, for that rent on a regular basis. Um, and so um, combining and having mixed income projects is going to become increasingly important just to pencil out the deal. Um, and to the extent that municipalities and the state can actually invest more money um, in these kind of tax credits, what it will do is it will jumpstart other investments. Now, I would recommend um, that most of these projects really should be mixed income, right? So building only low income housing in an area usually defeats the purpose of broadly what you're trying to achieve. If you reference back to the chart where I talked about the sustainable competitive advantages, and I put up this chart here around um, the uh, Uptown project, which is in Tampa, one of the things that's really critical is there's an area here of low income folks where you see it says UACDC. Um, but if you left everything alone, this would become middle class very, very quickly because all of it is in a walkable space, easy to get to, could be redeveloped very, very quickly. The hospitals are always worried about having, you know, a large number of low income people in proximity. But the reality is a portion of those law, low income people work at the hospital. They also want to be able to have other people that work at their hospital, not drive and commute an hour, but live in proximity. So combining those two things together is really the key to longer term success. Um, and that's where the low income housing tax credit at 9% additional vouchers is key to actually jumpstarting that. The other is around infrastructure. In order for us to build vertically in this market, we actually need to recreate a wastewater department that doesn't exist and the infrastructure around transportation. So that kind of infrastructure investment and that kind of investment around uh, low income housing to spur mixed uh, developments is actually key. That, that's great, Bo. And uh, all of this information has been fabulous. I, I wish we had another hour to continue to discuss. Uh, we've ran out of time, but uh, I want to tell everybody that uh, noavaid.org is New Orleans Business Alliance webpage. We have some information about Opportunity Zones there. And as we continue to work with Bo with different programs, we will make sure to update everybody to our webpage and different uh, th this type of panels uh, uh, on the work that we're doing. Uh, my email is going to show up on the screen at the end of this, this session. So if you have any additional questions that you thought were not answered or that occurs to you after the session, please reach out and we'll make the best effort to, to answer them. But again, Bo, we are very grateful for your time, your expertise, and uh, it's always fabulous to, to work with you and, and hear your thoughts. So thank you so much for your time. Thank um, you. Yeah, and, and I hope uh, to see you here in New Orleans soon. As, uh, I can't I know wait. You, yeah, I, I know you, you, you're itching to come here and we're itching to have you. So thank you again. And uh, before we, we conclude our session, I do want to hand it over to Nicole De Pietro. She's the uh, ULI Louisiana District Manager. Uh, she's great uh, to work with as well. And she has a message uh, to conclude this session. So thank you everybody for joining. And I hope to see you in our next Real Estate Breakfast. It's also gonna be in a virtual format this year. Uh, and it's gonna take place in November 26th. And we're gonna have 
um, a great speaker as well. Maybe not as good as you, Bo, but, but we'll try. We'll try. You set the, the expectations really high. Well, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you, Alejandra. Um, I just wanted to thank Nola BA for being an amazing partner with ULI and um, Bo, you're a great speaker. I just wanted to give a quick plug to our upcoming events. Um, in this virtual, in this time of COVID-19, we have kind of, we have pivoted entirely virtually, which has kind of given us an opportunity to kind of expand our reach. So for now, we are inviting all all members of the community, members of ULI and non-members to attend our events. Um, so we will be having a virtual happy hour um, next week on the 4th at five o'clock. Um, we're gonna have a focus on closing a house during COVID. Um, we have a program called Urban Plan, <clears throat> which we will be doing a virtual volunteer training on June 25th. We're gonna continue um, some economic development discussion with a panel um, about you know, an economic reforecast. We are doing a book club around the book, The Color of Law. Um, and if you're interested in joining ULI, we are going to have a new member orientation August 21st um, to kind of go over the benefits of membership um, and everything that you can do to get involved in the real estate development community in uh, the state of Louisiana. And um, the next NOLA BA breakfast, it's going to be virtual, is going to be November 5th. So um, if you're interested in getting more involved with ULI, you can please contact me. My information is at the end of this presentation. Um, and we will be sure to send this recording to everyone who participated. And I think we're going to make it live on our YouTube channel, um, which I just started recently. So um, thanks again. And we hope to connect with you soon.